so it should be it should be okay now. So yeah, so first of first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me. So it's kind of a pity I couldn't go and see this magnificent landscape that you showed us yesterday. But yeah, that's that's the way it is this year. So we are, we have to make make do with that. Um, so today I want to speak about polynomials equation in in crypto and try to discuss uh, how they can be used, uh, especially for cryptanalytic purpose, but sometimes for constructive purpose, and what are the are the relevant problem and what are the easy cases. Okay, what? Okay, I, yeah, okay. Here, here I am, I wasn't in the right window, it's kind of hard to move the things, but yeah. So first, the motivation and background. So the first thing is that it's kind of natural, something that you can do very easily. Whenever you get a cryptographic problem, it's usually easy to take it and convert it into a system of equation. At the very least, you can do it in a crazily generic way. You just say, okay, there is some computer program that implements the stuff. There are some secret values, some known inputs and output. You can just write the full program as a Boolean circuit and you just you just compute everything by just uh, replacing the circuit by a Boolean equation and you have something completely generic that turns your cryptographic problem into a system of equation. Of course, if you do it generically, it's kind of going to explode because you are going to have one variable for each internal state of your program, which might be a little bit bigger. Well, polynomial size if your program is efficient, but still quite, uh, quite big. But you, you can do it very generically. And uh, so you can always generically turn your cryptographic problem into a system of Boolean equations. For example, that's one way you might look at DS and say, OK, that's easy. DS is just a polynomial's equation in the key variable. And if I write them down correctly, try to solve them, I should be able to break it. Well, it turns out it's not so easy. But yeah, that's something I want to discuss. But well, sometimes you can do the conversion between the cryptographic problem and the polynomial in a much, much, much more efficient way. And typically, uh, well, if you have RSA with exponent three, which is something which was around for a long time, now we prefer slightly bigger exponent, but let's forget about it. Uh, inverting RSA uh, with exponent three is just solving this, um, th this equation. You have, um, you have some encrypted message you have, uh, and you want to compute a cube root of it. So you just want to solve this equation x cubed minus m equals zero modulo some number. Okay, it turns out that is, this is not so easy to do. And thankfully, otherwise RSA would be kind of broken. Um, for DS, I just mentioned it in passing. So you can really write everything as, a, as Boolean polynomials in the, in the variable of the key. But you can do it in more, even in lots of other systems. So recently, people have been doing for, um, for post-quantum crypto, they have been looking at, isogenies, at, at isogeny, isogeny based crypto. And in isogeny based crypto, what happens is that, OK, uh, you have these elementary steps that should be kind of easy to compute, which are low degree isogeny. And you start from a curve, and you take a long path of isogeny until you get to another another final curve. And it turns out that every small step can be encoded by a low degree polynomial, which has a special name. It's a modular polynomial, but it doesn't really matter. It's phi two of G0, G1, where these two things are the G invariant of the curves. And uh, this means that there is one step that goes from the curve zero to curve one. And there is one step that goes from one to two, etc until you reach the final thing. So you, you are able to write down the recovery of the isogeny pass into this polynomial system of equation. Well, once again, it turns out that this is going to be kind of hard to, to solve, but, but you can write it naturally as a system of, uh, of, of polynomials. Um, you can also do it for discrete log. So, um, well, for discrete log, basically, if you have a, if you have binary variable x0, x1, xk, you can just write the problem you want to solve as this big product minus the value. So 
where G is a generator of the subgroup, this big product minus H should just be zero in the group. Okay, the group is whatever it is, but you can view this as a polynomial equation. At least if this is a, a multiplicative group of a finite field, it's, a, it's an easy case where you can view this as a polynomial equation. And of course, since we wanted all the X values to be zero or one, um, well, you, we want to add this equation that just says that every value is just zero or one. Well, let's check that this product is doing whatever we want. So what is this product? So when X zero is zero, this is just one. Good. When X zero is one, this is G. And this one is either one or G squared. And this, this next one is either one or G to the four. And the final one is either one or G to the two to the something. So it means that if you just take the, the ones that appear in the binary decomposition of the exponent of, of H written in base G, you just get whatever you wanted. So it's clear that this solves the discrete log if you're able to solve this, uh, this system of polynomial equation. So, okay, these are just a few maybe stupid examples, but just to show that writing cryptographic problem as system of equation is something that occurs very, very naturally. So this is why I want to go into that and try to discuss it a bit uh, today. Oops. Okay. So um, also in some cases, just writing the thing as system of equation is a good way to break a crypto system. So remember, I was speaking about RSA or with exponent three, and the fact that if you have if you if you are encrypting uh, and you want to solve, you just have to solve this equation modulo n. But you might remember that if we take the same plain text and if we encrypt it for many recipients, just by using the Chinese reminder theorem, we can lift the equation no longer modulo some number, but we can lift it to the integers. And it turns out that over this integer, the integers, solving this equation, which is just computing cube roots of numbers, is something very easy to do. So in that case, we have, we have broken RSA with exponent three in the case of many recipients for the same message, just by, uh, by putting together into, uh, into a polynomial equation over, the, over the, uh, the integers. Okay. So something which, uh, um, which you might know about um, is linear feedback shift register. So this is something that has been used for a very, very long time uh, to produce pseudo-random sequences. And um, originally it was done by, for, to, to build pseudo-random generator, not of cryptographic interest, just pseudo-random generator for other kind of applications. And it turns out that these things are completely broken from the crypto point of view, because just by observing the output, you can write linear equation over GF2 that allows you to, to solve the equation and, and recover the, the initial state of the linear feedback register. Okay, of course, uh, you can fix that by, uh, by putting what are called filters, which remove the linearity and try to hide the equation into something more complicated. But if you don't do it, then you just convert into some, a linear system. So a system of equation, which is easy to solve. And, um, and as an analogy to the elliptic curve case where we have this isogeny pass and uh, I explained that we could write it as a system of equation but not solve it. Uh, in fact, you can do something completely analogous using a more, well, a different object which is less known to people usually which are called Dreamfeld modules. But it turns out that in that case, you can write down finding an isogeny pass as a system of equation, which is linear and easy to solve. So really trying to write down cryptographic problem as system of equation might be a good way to break some of them. Good. And uh, so now what I want to do is uh, look at this system of polynomial equations and try to figure out the various cases. So it's really hugely complicated because there are so many parameters, so many things we can do. I'm not going to, to be able to cover everything. I'm just going to try to focus on a few important stuff. And um, 
So, well, just to have a, to show you the kind of variety, when you want to solve system of equation, you can try to solve them over finite fields, or over the real or complex number. You can try to solve over rings, which is a ra again different from looking at fields. Uh, you can look at linear equations, which is something we basically know how to do. You can, but you can also have nonlinear system. The number of variables is going to be extremely important. The fact that the system is either sparse with very few coefficients in the, in the equation or, or dense is going to change the thing a lot. Uh, the fact that the solutions might have some, some structures that we know in advance because of whatever reason, and it often happens in crypto, uh, can also help. The fact that the system has too many or too few equations can help. Yeah, there are so many things. And uh, depending on whether you want a single solution or all of them, it's going to change. It's, it's really very complicated. There are many, many parameters. Um, but the first thing we need to do is basically to try to find out, to figure out what are the easy cases we know to solve easily, and then try to discuss what, what the hard cases are and how we can, uh, we can look at them. And this is going to be the main goal of, uh, of this lecture. So first, of course, I'm going to try with the easy cases. And um, the first and easiest case that you all know about, basically, is linear systems. So, um, well, maybe there is not much to tell if you already know about them, but it's still something which is, which is very rich and, uh, and sometimes surprising. So basically, the idea is that when you have a linear system written as some matrix A times a vector X is equal to some vector B. So here the A is known, B is known, and we want to find to solve for the variable X. Uh, these things are easy to solve. Well, you all know that it's almost cubic in the dimension. You just use a Gaussian elimination and you are done. Okay. Well, this is true if you work over a field because you can do inversion of numbers. There is no problem there. You can really do it nicely. If you are working over rings, it's slightly more complicated. Sometimes, well, if you have to invert elements that you can't invert, typically you are working modulo a power of two and you want to invert two because there is a two somewhere on the diagonal of your matrix, it's going to be problematic. And if you really want all the solution, it might be a little bit tricky to write these things down. But most of the time you can do it. And you can either get a single solution if you just want one, or compact description of all solution when, when they are available. But even there, when I say that you have a compact description of all solution, it's, it's kind of misleading in some way. Because assume now, you, you tell me I can perfectly solve this system. I know all the solution. OK, so, so if you know all the solution, can you give me one with seven ones, three twos, and uh, one three, one four, one minus seven, et cetera? And this is not easy to do. And usually, and, and in fact, it's a hard problem. So having a compact description of all solution Mine is not enough to find one specific solution with extra properties. So even linear system can be can be hard to solve if you just add x if you just add extra constraint on it and want specific kind of solution. So it's it's something uh, not, not so easy. Um, also, well, cubic algorithm, it's fine, but maybe we can do better. Well, it turns out that asymptotically you can because the exponent of matrix multiplication is better than three, but it's really very hard to use, uh, to use in practice. You can, you can improve things a bit, but not that much. But there is a very specific case that, very, that often appear in crypto. It's the case of, linear, of sparse linear systems. So you have system of, of, of equations uh, where you have a huge matrix, but only a small number, well, relatively small number of entries in the big matrix. Um, or, or as these kids showing on the, on the screen, that's kind of fun. Okay. <laughs> um, so what, what was I saying? 
Uh, I was Sorry saying about that, that they're very interested in polynomials. They are very interested by polynomial systems. That's good. Um, and uh, they, they can speak about that at school next uh, next week. Then. And um, so, so for the sparse linear systems, uh, it's 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 really tricky because um, the matrix is huge, but but it's sparse. So if you want to represent it in memory, you don't use as much space as you would need for a full matrix. But now in that case, if you start doing Gaussian elimination, it's a nightmare because you start doing linear combination of lines. And what is happening is that every time you do that, the matrix fills up a bit. And after a few steps, it's so full that you, you run out of memory and you can't represent the matrix anymore. So being cubic, it's fine for running time, but for memory, it can be nightmarish. So sometimes you, you, you go into a system where you can't solve the system just because it's going to be too big to write. And this, this occurs a lot. When uh, for the linear um, the linear systems that occur when we do discrete log of factoring, and in that case, what we are using instead are, are things that are called structure Gaussian elimination or and, and also iterative algorithm which are really good and uh, allows you to solve without having to explode your memory. So even for linear systems, there are plenty of things that needs to be to be told. But but this is not the main uh, topic of my uh, of my talk today, so I'm just yeah, going uh, quickly over that. Okay. Another easy case, uh, which is which is very important, is the case of univariate polynomial over finitude. So I give you um, a polynomial equation, <coughs> and I ask you what are the roots of the equation. And it turns out this is a very well-known problem. And finding roots of, of polynomial of a finite field is something which, is, which can be done very efficiently. Well, at least uh, if the degree of f is not too big. And why is that? Uh, I'm just going to, to give a, a little bit of hints on how it is done. And the first thing is to remember that whenever you have an element of the finite field fp, it, it is going to satisfy alpha to the p is equal to alpha. And this is key to solving, uh, to finding roots of this kind of polynomial, because any root of f, which is in fp, is also going to be a root of x to the p minus x. So now we just compute the GCD of the two polynomials, and we are almost done. Well, but you might ask me, how do you compute the GCD of this thing? If you just, you know, if you just do it stupidly, just reducing this huge degree polynomial modulo f is going to be very, very costly. Well, thankfully, Ben told us yesterday how to do it. We are just going to compute x to the p mod f quickly using the square and multiply algorithm. And once you have x to the p mod f, you subtract x. You have two polynomials of degrees the same as f or maybe minus one, but it doesn't really matter. And then you can do the GCD kind of efficiently. At worst, it's going to be quadratic in the degree. Okay. Once you have done that, what you get is uh, what you get is a polynomial that has the same root as f, but everything that was extraneous has been removed. So you just have the roots. So the only thing that remains to be done now is to separate the root. And the key idea here is to use GCD again, but to note that this polynomial, x to the p minus x, split into three parts. It's x. So if there is 0 as a root, you just see it because the constant coefficient of your polynomial is 0. Otherwise, it's, you have these two parts. So by computing a GCD with this or with that, you split the root. Into two, into two subsets of roots, and uh, you are reducing the size of the problem. And the thing is that we can almost iterate this. Well, of course, you, if you have taken the GCD with that once, you can't do it again. It would give the same thing again and again. But it turns out that, that this polynomial x to the p minus x, if you replace 
x here by x plus any constant and x here by x plus the same constant, the original values are also going to be roots of this because if you just shift, it still it remains in, in the finite field. And the thing is that for this splitting here, it's, it's making things independent. So we have a recursive algorithm that takes all the root together, splits them in two parts, and do it again and again and again until they are on their own and you can just read them off from degree one polynomial. And as I told you, the, the important part in the complexity is this, is this computation of GCD, which is at, at most quadratic in the degree. And it turns out that there are even more efficient methods which are less than quadratic in the degree. So it's degree to the power 1.5 or something like this. And you, and you have to take into account a few things, but, but it's really very, very, very fast. So this is another of the easy case, which is very important to know. Okay. Uh, the next case is, I was speaking about uh, problems over a ring. So what happens if we look at univariate polynomial over a ring z over nz? And it turns out that this is easy to solve. You just take n, you write it as a product of prime powers. Uh, if it is square free, you just solve modulo every power and, and, and then just pass all the possibility mod p1 with all the possibility mod p2 with all the possibility mod p3 using the Chinese reminder theorem. And that's it. Well, if, it, if there is a, a power p1 square or p1 cubed that divides, you have to use n-cell lifting to get the root modulo the prime powers, but, but it can also be done. But the thing is that you can only do that if you know the factorization of it. So it requires a factoring algorithm. So that's why it was hard in the case of RSA because solving the, the equation x cubed minus n equals zero would be easy if we knew the factorization of n. But since this is a secret in RSA, there is a problem. Um, another easy case, which is, which is sometimes important, not that much in crypto, but it sometimes happens, is that if you have univariate polynomial over Z, over Z, it's very easy. You just, you know, compute the real roots using any, uh, any, uh, any an algorithm from analysis to, to compute the root. You can separate them using Sturm algorithm. You can get them with arbitrary precision using Newton iterations. There are plenty of ways to do that. And once you have the real roots, if they are very close to an integer, you want to check if they are really integral roots. In that case, well, you just round to the, next, to the nearest integer. And once you did that, you substitute into, into the polynomial and check that it gives zero. If it doesn't, it's not a root. If it does give zero, it's a root and you have it. But with more variables, as soon as you have two variables, in fact, what, what we get are called Diophantine equations. And these things are extremely hard to solve. In fact, they are so hard to solve that you can even encode undecidable problem into Diophantine equations. So, so everything is possible with this thing, every level of difficulty. And even with two variables, it's, it's really difficult in general. And even one special case, which is the case of two A's equation, which is known to be kind of easy-ish, is really already computationally intensive. So in order to solve the easiest case, you already need a lot and lot of work. So there is the big, contrast between going from one variable to many and even with two variables, it's already difficult. And this is kind of a, a very important thing. Okay, and uh, I want to, to note that by contrast over a finite field, if you give me a polynomial with, I don't know, with 10 variables and you just ask for one solution, it's usually very easy to do. What you do is just, you just, okay, choose one of the variable, pick them at random, substitute in the equation, and you check whether the remaining thing has a root. If it doesn't, you do it again, but you are going to succeed very quickly usually. So 
So this is uh, this is a very efficient approach where you guess some of the variable and just solve for the remaining one. Of course, you are not going to get all the solutions that way, but you you can easily get one. Okay. And uh, the final thing I want to say about uh, easy cases is I told you that. I told you that Diophantine equations are hard and that going to two variables is difficult and that also over, um, over um, sorry, over z, for, for z over n, z over rings, it's difficult when you can't factor. And it turns out that around 2000, Copper Smith proposed an algorithm which solves these two problems. So you can find uh, solution of low, degree of low degree polynomial modulo n, and you can find solution of low degree uh, bivariate Diophantine equation, assuming that the solution are small. So by adding this constraint that the solution has some structure which is coming from somewhere else, the, syst the, the system that was hard to solve suddenly become easy. Well, easy-ish. The algorithm is not so easy to understand. It's based on lattice reduction, and it does lattice reduction of some kind of encoding of Macaulay matrix. I will discuss about this matrix later, which is why I, I put this here. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's very important to note that by just adding this extra constraint on the solution, something which was difficult become easy. And uh, so, so polynomial equations are, are something uh, where you really need to pay, uh, to pay attention to what is happening in order to know whether it's easy or hard to, to solve. Okay, um, that's the end of my first part. So, well, my first part, my two parts are kind of unbalanced. So one is too short for, for, the, for the one hour and the other is, is too long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start uh, slowly in the second part and uh, we will, uh, we will have plenty of, uh, we will use the second hour to, to, to conclude that because the easy cases are going to take much less time than the hard ones. Okay. So what I want to discuss now are the hard cases and algorithm for solving some of them and uh, so, some of this. So, and again, I want to look at variation. So I told you linear system are easy to solve. But something very interesting which happened in the past few years is that despite the fact that linear systems are easy to solve, um, if you just add noise in the linear system of equations, then they become very hard. And in fact, it's the basis of all the post-quantum systems known as, learn as learning with error or crypto, where, where, where you just add noise to turn the system into something, uh, from something easy into something difficult. So you remember when we had a, a linear system, it was just solve AX equal B. But now when you add noise, you want to solve AX approximately equal to B, uh, you, which you can rewrite as AX plus small noise is equal to B. Okay. And it turns out that this is much, 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 much more difficult. And, uh, and there is this, this, this theorem by Regev that if you could do that, then you could, uh, you could do lattice reduction in a very strong way. Uh, but, but okay, you, you need quantum computer to look at these things, but it's, it's something which is, very, uh, which is very interesting. Just by, uh, by making this variation, the system becomes, uh, becomes hard when it was easy before. And it's, it's basically the same thing that happened for Copper Smith's algorithm, but in the reverse direction. By just taking a small variation, the problem goes from hard to easy or from easy to hard. So you, we really need to, uh, to pay attention. But what I wanted to show there for these linear systems with noise is that it's often possible, well, it's most of the time possible to write them into, uh, into polynomial equations of higher degree. So we have something which is linear with noise and we are going to convert it into something which is going to be, um, to be exact, but of higher degree. 
So how do you do that? Well, it's easy. For every element of the noise, we are going to associate a new variable. So here I'm calling this variable x. And we are going to, to write down polynomials that encode the fact that these, this noise is small. So for example, if you allow the, the element of the noise to be minus 1, 0, or 1, then for every variable in the noise, so I should have written them e instead of x, but okay. for every variable in the noise, we are going to add the equation that the variable cubed minus itself is going to be 0. Okay, and this encodes the fact that the, the, the error can only be minus 1, 0, or 1. Of course, if you are allowing larger errors, then you need higher degrees. And uh, this might become not so, not so nice, but you can also look for alternative ways to encode this into, uh, into poly polynomial system. So, but there is, there is this reduction between this, uh, this linear system with noise to polynomial equation of higher degree. And this is something I, this is something I wanted to uh, I wanted to show. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So another uh, another problem, which is uh, which is very uh, very similar to one of the easy cases we have seen, and which turns out to to be seemingly very difficult. I don't know how much this has been studied, but um, it's just you take univariate polynomial over finite field. But now, instead of having them of being of small degree, you just ask for, to have polynomials with a small number of monomials. So you just want the polynomial to be sparse, but they could be of very high degree. And the thing is that if you do that, suddenly, they become way harder to solve. In fact, the only way we know how to do is just apply the thing, but it's going to be quadratic in the degree. So if the degree is big, it's not going to be a good algorithm, despite the fact that it can be encoded into a very small problem. So even finding roots of univariate polynomial can become hard if you just use a sparse encoding for the polynomials. So this is, uh, this is interesting. But what I want to show here is that, again, this hard looking problem can be transformed into a, poly, a system of polynomial equation with more variable and uh, of, of, of higher degree. But it's, it's more, the, the important thing here is, is that it's with more variable. So for example, take this univariate polynomial, x to the 1025 plus x to the 69 plus 1. Okay, I claim that I can write it uh, as a system with uh, 11 variables by just, say, by just putting the equation x1 minus x squared equals 0, x2 minus x1 squared equals 0, uh, uh, x10 minus x9 squared equals 0. So this just says, okay, once again, I'm going to build uh, a square and multiply algorithm. So I'm going to take x, x squared, x to the 4, x to the 8 and label them x, x1, x2, x3, etc. And then I'm going to write this thing, f of x equals 0, as x10 times x plus x6 times x2 times x plus 1 equals 0. So now I have a system of uh, 11 equations of degree at most 3 in 11 variables. OK, and uh, if I can solve that, then I can solve my, uh, uh, my sparse univariate uh, polynomial problem. And this transformation is very generic if, uh, if the maximum degree that appears here is, let's say, n or d, uh, then the number of variables is going to be logarithmic in this degree d. And uh, the degree of, uh, of the equation of this one, all, all of those are going to be quadratic. And this one is going to have degree, which is at most the number of variables. So it's going to be uh, also logarithmic in the initial degree. So you can encode this sparse problem into a multivariate problem kind of easy. OK. Um, 
So it turns out that we are we, we see that there are lots of, of things that we can we, we can do for to get other problems, other polynomial system of equation. And in some way, you can always relate them to multivariate system of polynomial equation. So in fact, this is going to be the, the thing I'm going to focus on now is uh, if I look at multivariate system of polynomial equation, how can I solve them? What are the, what, what are the, the tools that we know to, to do that and, and how does it work? And what is really interesting first is that this is an NPR problem. So if you take systems of, uh, of polynomials equation, basically as soon as, as it's not linear and, uh, and if you have enough variable, then it's, it's very difficult. And uh, it, it's well known that even if you do it over uh, GF2 and have quadratic equation, it's already an NPR problem. And in general, there are tons of applications. There are so many things that can be expressed into systems of polynomial equation just because uh, many of the, if you look at robotics, for example, the configuration of a robot can often be encoded by polynomial equation. Uh, if you look at algebraic geometry, all the equation of surfaces and stuff are just, uh, are just polynomial equations. So if we are able to solve these things, we really have a tool for, for a huge number of, uh, of applications. The problem is that these systems are really hard to, to solve and there are tons of difficult things that occur. There. And in fact, in crypto, we are kind of lucky because we are usually interested by solving polynomials equation over finite fields. And this, this is nice because it removes one of the huge problem is when, when you try to do polynomials equation, let's say over the rationals, what is happening is whenever you, you, whenever you do the computation, as the coefficient that appears, so the rational numbers, as you try to do computation to solve the thing, they are growing and growing and growing very quickly and it just explodes. Okay, and, and it turns out that uh, in, the, in these cases where you can have the explosion of coefficient or you have to worry about precision, solving these things can be hugely difficult. And there are examples where trying to do these computations and solving these things is going to, to be more than exponential. It's going to be doubly exponential. It's going to be two to the two to the size of the initial thing. This is nightmarish. And thankfully for us, when you are working over fine fields, uh, the behavior is slightly better and we, we, we can do more things. So it's, it's kind of nice. And uh, well, since I mentioned the case, of DS initially that can directly be written in that form of multivariate systems over GF2. I would like to mention that the case of GF2 is something particularly interesting for us. And, uh, and basically I am going to focus on GF2 and look at what is happening. Okay. So, so I want to do polynomial systems and I want to look at the Boolean case. So, so assume that I just give you a bunch of equations in many variables, and you want to find one or all the solution uh, obtained by assigning to every variable any possibility of zeros and one over two. Okay, so you just, uh, you just write down these equations Okay, so this is my initial system of equation and I'm writing down M equations in N variables and the degree which is kind of important is degree at most. And since I want only the zero one solution, I'm going to have this extra equation which are called the field equation. And very often I'm not even going to write them down. They are going to be implicit. So I just want to point out something here. I'm writing x1 square plus x1 equals zero. You might tell me, you might tell me, okay, if it's zero or one, why don't you write x1 square minus x1 equals zero? Well, it's because we are working mode two, so minus one and plus one is just the same thing. 
So, so I'm writing like this. But for a moment, let's look at this, this thing and let's try to understand why it can be, it's going to be implicit. So every polynomial, what is it going to be? Clearly, it's going to be a return as a sum of monomials with, with some coefficient. But since the coefficients are only 0 or 1, you can just say that the polynomial is a sum of monomials. And when you look at the monomials that appear in any polynomial, what can they be? Well, in general, when you write polynomials, a monomial is every variable with some power. But in our case, you see that if you have a power of two, you can replace it by one. But of course, if you have a power of three, you can also replace it by one. And any power of x1 is just x1. So it means that the only monomial that appears in f1, f2, fn are just simple products of variables. Okay, that's the only things that are going to appear in my, uh, in my system. So, okay, it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of important to note that. So in particular, if I do some multiplication of monomials or, or things, any variables that during the multiplication will appear with a power higher than one, it's just going to be truncated down to one. Okay, so I have these three parameters, number of polynomials, number of variables, and, uh, and degree of the initial equation. And, even degree two is going to be something kind of hard. So for you can set in your mind that we are going to work with quadratic equation just to, just, just to, to, to have something nice uh, to, to think of. Okay. So these systems are also known as just Boolean systems of, of equation. Okay. So since we are looking at this Boolean system of equation, I want to mention one specific application that of, of this system that was proposed, uh, well, probably in the 90s. I don't even remember the exact date, but um, okay. And this thing, this application is called multivariate crypto. And multivariate crypto was using the fact that Boolean systems are hard to solve as a hard cryptographic problem to be cryptographic applications. Okay, so we have this core problem, solving Boolean system is difficult, and we want to build, uh, we want to build cryptographic functionality out of that. So the two easiest uh, functionalities that we might want are just signature scheme and encryption. So what are we going to do here? The main idea is to build a system of Boolean equations, but with a trapdoor. So this is something that was that has been uh, around in crypto for a long time, trying to build stuff with trapdoors. So having a trapdoor means that we have a problem which is hard to solve if you only know the public version of it. But if you know the private representation of the problem, which has more structure in it, then the problem becomes easy to solve. Okay. And uh, well. So, so if, you, if you could build such system, then doing a signature or doing encryption is not too difficult. To do signature, it's kind of easy. You solve the equation F applied to the, the signature itself, the value you want to find as signature, should be equal, as usual, to a hash value of something random, which is going to be given out as part of the signature on the message. And if you could do that, you get kind of a valid signature scheme uh, because anyone with a public representation can recompute F on the signature and test that it is really equal to the hash value. Okay, so basically, if you can invert the, if you can solve this equation, you can construct signatures. And uh, for encryption, um, to encrypt, you just take the value you want to encrypt, you evaluate F on this value, you get some Y, and you, put, you, you just send it as a, let's say, a key exchange token. And the, the person that, that receives it and knows the private representation 
solve this equation and find some secret. Okay, you might tell me if there are many solutions to the system, then how do you know it's the right one? Well, what you do usually is you, you, you do some stuff to make sure that there is going to be a unique solution. You just add extra equation or whatever on the, and that's fine. And the thing is that if you can solve Boolean system, then you are going to break this. Thing. Okay. But there is another direction of attack. If the trapdoor has not been uh, built securely, then you can just recover the trapdoor and use the easy solution to solve the system. So it, even if this is hard in general, it's not clear that you can build something hard with a trapdoor that makes it easy. This is a slightly different problem. So this is why it's not so easy to build uh, multivariate crypto schemes. It's because you, you, don't know, you don't only rely on the hardness of solving Boolean system, you also rely on the fact that you have some ad hoc way of building a trapdoor, and this ad hoc way might be attacked. And that's why, uh, that's why it's many crypto, multivariate crypto uh, systems have been broken in the past, is because there was something weird going on in the trapdoor construction. Okay, so a typical example of, uh, of multivariate crypto is a system that is called HFE. Uh, which means hidden field equation. And this system is kind of nice because it's putting together tons of ingredients I have already, uh, I have already displayed in this talk and, uh, and turn it into a, into a crypto system. So, okay. So the private structure is going to be solve some equation f of x equal y in f of two to the x. So, this is going to be a polynomial equation in a single variable and uh, with of a degree which is going to be kind of small. So this is going to be easy to solve because the degree is small. And there are going to be a, a few extra constraints on, on the choice of monomials that appear in F in order to make the, the public version uh, of degree two. So you, okay, this is a little bit tricky. I don't want to go into the details, but it means that the, the exponents of X can only be powers of two or sum of two powers of two. If you put sums of three or more power of two, then you will, you will get degrees which are too big for the public, uh, the public representation. So you don't want to do that. Okay, so you have this private equation, which is easy to solve. And now we want to trap the rate. So to trap the read, uh, you just choose any alpha that forms a polynomial basis for the finite field. So it means that every element of f of two to the n can be written as sum of as a sum of powers of alpha. And now, if you can do that, you can say, okay, I'm going to write x formally as a sum of x i alpha to the i where xi are just zero or one value. So Boolean variables. And now you just write down f once you have done this substitution in it. Okay, and what you get is a polynomial in all the variable xi times one, plus a polynomial in all the variable times alpha, plus a polynomial times alpha squared. Etc. So you have for every coordinate you have one polynomial. You just write down this polynomial, and this is almost going to be the polynomial equation. Almost because you don't want to publish them that way; it would be weak. What you do is instead is you apply an, ar an arbitrary invertible linear transform. So you just mix up the, the equations without changing the, the, the space that they generate. The, the vector space that you generate. And once you have done that, you have your public system. So the public system is just going to be given by n polynomials of degree two in n variables. It's very easy to evaluate. And so you can easily check whether anything is a solution of, a, of an equation. But as far, um, as far as we know for the moment, it seems 
for random looking, it seems up to, to solve. Okay, so, um, so this is this is the basic idea of the uh, this is the basic idea of the system. Good, and um, and in fact, it turns out that if you don't put any constraint on the degree of f, you could basically encode any quadratic system into such an equation. So, so it seems to be quite powerful, but we have to put a limit on the on the degree just to make the system easy to solve in the private so system. So, and this is putting some constraint on the public one. I'm not going to go much into a too much into that, but it's a, it, it's a very nice example of how all these things go together, of how you can use something easy to solve, make it into something hard looking and uh, with plenty of, of objects that I'm, that I'm discussing today. Good. Um, nice. So now we know about this system and we know about the application and we want to solve it. So since all the variable can take zero one value, one very natural thing is, well, just try everything and see what happens. Okay, this is called exhaustive search and you all know about it and you know that, well, what we need to do is just, we take two to the n values, we evaluate the polynomials at this two to the n value and we check whether it's zero everywhere. Okay, then if we do that stupidly, how much would it cost? Um, well, at least you would have to evaluate n polynomials two to the n time. So you expect a cost of which would, which would look like n time two to the n. Okay. It, well, it's, it's more than two to the n. You have this extra factor in front and it's not clear it, it's optimal. And in fact, it's not optimal at all. There are tons of optimizations that can be done. And, um, and these optimization really change things a lot and makes exhaustive search a very, very efficient technique for solving this kind of system. So one first thing you might notice is that there is no point in evaluating f of i plus one uh, if it's not already zero for f1, f2, f, fi. So that would be a, a stupid way to reduce the complexity a little bit. So what you do is, okay, you evaluate f1 on every point, but you only evaluate f2 on half of the point because basically half of the point are going to be, to be to evaluate to zero and half of them to one. So you only evaluate F2 on half of the point, you only evaluate F3 on one fourth of the point, etc. And when you sum these things together, you basically get two to the n plus one, which is, which is much better than m time two to the n. So you can already reduce the number of evaluation just by, by doing this kind of, uh, of very basic trick. But in fact, we can do better. So another thing you can do, if you, if you have looked at, uh, at software uh, techniques that are used in crypto, there is something which is called bit slicing. And bit slicing is a, a, an idea that was, uh, well, okay. It, so I, I, it was, it was uh, initially invented for, for DES, I think, to do fast uh, enumeration of keys. Uh, and it was in the group of Adi Shamir. And, uh, and, and basically the idea of bit slicing, there is a very stupid way to look at it. it. It's going to say, okay, you have a computer that operates on word of 32 or 64 bit or whatever, it doesn't really matter. And you can view it instead as a computer that operates on vectors of 32 bits. And every time you do binary operation, you can do them on vectors. So what you do, for example, for DES, you just encode the binary circuits that evaluate DES, you write it down, and you evaluate on 32 points at the same time. 
And uh, you can do that in, in general with polynomial equation. You just write them down as, uh, as binary operation. You know, multiplication is on the addition is so also. These are just very basic operation and you can evaluate in parallel on 32 or 62 position or 64 position depending on the on the, the size of your register. Okay, so this is this already gains uh, a factor which is basically the size of your of the register in your CPU, which is a nice factor to get. Uh, you can do even better. And I'm going to go into, into that. You can use something called gray codes uh, to, to do the evaluation much more efficiently because you, are, you, you evaluate at one point and then at another point, but you make sure that these two points only differ in one bit. And if they only differ in one bit, updating the evaluation is much less costly than recomputing from scratch. And this is something that is good, that can be done very efficiently. And, and to do this, this, mod this modification, you use kind of derivatives of polynomial. I'm going to speak about them. And all this gives uh, very, very nice things. So if you want to look at software implementations, there is a state-of-the-art implementation by Guyage in uh, something called Glibfez, uh, you, which you can find online. And there are some, uh, some hardware implementation of this stuff on FPGA that can really solve a Boolean system of, of equation really, really, really quickly. And uh, I think you can, you can solve uh, systems with something like 40 variable in, in a couple of minutes. You can try the two to the 40 uh, values in just a couple of minutes on a, on, on a laptop. So it's really, really fast. OK. Um, if I remember correctly, you can, you can do something like at every clock cycle, you try something like five different, uh, different assignments. So that's a lot uh, in just a very short amount of time. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is show you how the gray codes work. And I think uh, we will go... Um, uh, we will go for the, the, the rest after the, after the break, uh, seeing the time. So I'm, the gray code, I'm not, not going to give you a formal description of what, what is happening, but just for, for, from an example on 4-bit, you should be able to figure it out on your own. So I want to enumerate all the 16 combinations starting from 0 and changing only one bit at a time. So here is how you go. You start from 0. And you just change one bit, which is the low order bit. OK, so you go from 0 to 1. Then you change one bit, which is no longer bit 0, but bit 1. So you go from 0, 0, 0, 1 to 0, 0, 1, 1. And then you change the low order bit again. And you go to 0, 0, 1, 0. And then you change bit 2. And you go to uh, this one, 0, 1, 1, 0. You change the bit zero, you go to that. You change bit one, you change bit zero, you change bit three, you change bit one, you change bit two. Uh, well, sorry, this is bit zero, this is bit one, bit zero, bit two, bit zero, bit two, bit zero, and you have finished. You, have, you went through every possibility uh, on this, in fact, this is an hypercube. I draw the okay. In my uh, on my picture, it looks like a cube, but I but I put two values at every corner of the cube. So in fact, it should it it would be better represented by an hypercube in dimension four. And in general, you have an hypercube in dimension n, and you just move along the the hypercube, going to every corner of the hypercube following the edges with a path that alternates that does zero, that does bit zero, bit one, bit zero, bit two, bit zero, bit one, bit zero, bit three. And there is a very simple rule to figure out which bit you need to change. And I'm not going to go into that, but, uh, but basically here you would go to the, to the fifth bits and, uh, and carry on. And that way you just change one bit at a time. And this is really very, this is a very, 
very important thing, and it's a key ingredient of, uh, of LibSafe. OK. So I propose to, to stop this part now. And uh, I'm going to look if there are any, any questions for the moment. And we can, uh, we can reconvene uh, in one hour or so at the next full hour. Yes. First of all, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, my camera's died on me, as you can see.